All right, let's see here. What do we have? Oh, my camera's way off. The games don't fit very well. Hello all, hello all, let's see here, get this going, whoops, can't spell. All right, let me get the transistors. Mm -hmm. Hey, hello, technical specialist. Sorry, I'm trying to get everything prepared here. Uh, got kind of a late start this morning. Or, well, this morning, now it's almost 2 o'clock, so I'm really behind. And how are things going? So what's the problem with this amp? Uh, which one? We have a B2 here, or I have a bass clef crescendo, uh, or crescendo bass clef, 17K. Once I locate the transistors for the output section here for that. Uh, the 59 and 30s. All right. So I've had a, I've asked a couple people which ones they wanted to uh, work on first. So this uh, crescendo, the bass clef, 17k here has a shorted output section. The owner of this amplifier shorted the output leads uh, while it was running, accidentally of course, uh, which I always say try not to mess around with the output of your amplifier while it is running because it will uh if anything shorts out you will instantly destroy the output section of the amplifier or possibly even the output section and the power supply so luckily the power supply of the crescendo amp here uh, did not suffer a failure it was just the output section so this really uh, in essence is a simple repair. Uh, the interesting thing about these is their the how they drive the output. So that's really what I wanted to go over today was how they design this board. Uh, this this is a real same, a similar board as to like your B2s. A lot of your bigger Korean style boards that use these uh, particular style here uses the same output uh, drive architecture. Both? Well, let's, uh, let's do both. So I have a really small uh, view of the camera, so I can't fit 
the crescendo amplifier all in the same view. So when I repair the output section of this and slide it back in and connect it back to the power supply, I'm not able to do that on this particular bench. So unfortunately, I'm not able to power this up um, on a live stream. I just, I don't have the right setup. I'm still working on it, guys, though, on the getting a different camera in to get a much wider view for you guys. That's why I have it set up now to where you can kind of see lengthwise of my workbenches here. Um, you're looking at about 12 feet of workbench. So uh, that's, I'm working on it. Surely but slowly, I will get to it, though. Hey, Daniel. Uh, there are buffer trims between the chip and the FETs. Yes, kind of, sort of. Are you talking, you're talking about the crescendo board here? Let me, um, let me scoot this B2 out of the way here, and let's, let's go ahead and talk about this. This is an interesting board. So the B2 had a auxiliary power supply fault which, uh, to be honest, I may or may not be able to repair because someone else has already tried to repair it. And I am not a big fan of taking on boards that have been worked on by somebody else. I'll do it, but it does take a lot more time to resolve any issues. Let me get my camera a little closer here for you guys. So what we have here is the 17K board and what they use are a uh, they use a card here that has a 072 I think it's a 211 or a 311 going into a, a 2184 uh, a gate drive IC I do believe that's the setup on this I I'm really bad with notes, uh, but I had an amp like this in before that they didn't deface the ICs. So if I remember right, it's your standard, almost like, uh, almost like your Type Four boards, uh, not quite like this, that have the zero uh, seven two, the three eleven or two eleven, and then your protection circuit, your two nine three or three nine three IC. So they use the same kind of board, a much smaller version of that board. And then they go into and a drive, a TO220 transistor here, that is the uh, the MIC, the 4452s. Which are these little guys right here. Hey there, hey Cliff, good to see you here. Uh, version of the, yes, yes. Um, uh, very similar to the VFL 22. Yes, except the VFL only had one driver card. Yeah, I think I have a. Um, I'm not sure if I had a VFL. I have a VFL in right now, the 1100, but I can't remember what the uh, output stage was. But this is what they use. This is from a. I do believe this is from a DC board. Uh, and of course they defaced, you know, the, uh, I don't even call these really, these are ICs, but they defaced it. And with some online help there, you, people will let you know what they are. Again, they're the MIC 4452ZTs. They're a 220, TO220 style driver. Uh, buffer, gate drive buffer. So they do, they use that 2184 to drive these uh, MIC 4452s. They're pretty robust. Um, I'm not sure if they have survived, but typically what I'll do is when I replace the output transistors, which side failed here, this side failed. So when I replace the output transistors, I will replace the, uh, the IC here. Just uh, as a precaution, um, again, I'm unable to really power this board up to uh, know the condition of the drive circuit. But a great way to know is when I pull the 
shorted transistors out and I reload the new bank in, I compare the resistance readings of the new bank versus the other banks. Give me just two seconds, guys. All right, sorry about that, guys. My my son had called me. Um, all right, where was I? Uh, Sam, super easy to have solder bridges with those. Uh, yes, it is very easy. How does that how does that tell you the condition of the drive card? Resistance. I know I'm different than a lot of other guys that repair amplifiers, but resistance will tell you so much about a, the condition of a circuit. If you, uh, for instance, this board's got what? We have, we have four separate sections. So I know one section is burnout. Another section here doesn't show any shorts. And this whole other side here doesn't show any shorts. So my resistance values between uh, gate drain, gate source, drain source, those resistance values will either be the same or they'll be different. So if I read these three banks here that have the same values, and then I come back over here to the bank that I'm replacing and it has a different resistance value, then I know that I have a defect somewhere in the drive. And that's when I go back through and I'll change the uh, the buffers that's in between the drive IC and the uh, output transistors. And if you look at it this way, it's that short's got a long ways to go. So you'll short the transistor, it'll make it through the gate resistor. If the gate resistor doesn't open, it'll make its way to the, the buffer, the IC that's in between the drive IC and the transistor. And then if it makes it through that, then it makes it up to the card. So it's got a many steps to go before it makes it all the way to the drive card. More often than not, it doesn't make it all the way back to the drive card. I have yet to replace the 2184, which I do have on hand, um, on one of these cards because it usually stops right here at the buffer transistors. So that's how uh, that's how I use resistance. I'm big on that. I know probably people disagree on using resistance, but uh, resistance will tell you a lot. Oh, if you try to do the same measurements of the FET when it's not in circuit. You'll get, if you try to do the same measurement to the FET when it's not in circuit, you will get nothing. You will typically always have a resistance value even when your transistors are out. Uh, so let's see here to the FET. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Glad to uh, stream because I work on some of his miss. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Damien. Yeah, I. Um, it's not very often I go live. I like to try to have as much interaction as possible with other techs. Uh, so I answer a lot of questions 
on the computer every evening. And if I can answer questions uh, through a live stream, that's less typing I have to do later. Uh, so, hey, it's Mike Connor. Hello. Hello. Glad you are here. Your amplifier, sir, is on the road as of yesterday. So, just let so you know there, Mike, it's on the way back to you. So, um, yes, those chips usually do survive. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that's the thing is, don't get me wrong, diode setting works great too. Uh, it shows you the forward voltage of a junction, I should say. Uh, but diode setting doesn't show you the resistance value of a complete circuit. It'll show you the forward voltage of the complete circuit. Uh, so again, it just goes to different mentalities of how I uh, approach things. Uh, let's see here. Since I don't have a scope running, what I can do is... I can get the uh, meter up and running for you guys. So let me just get this meter fired up here so we can see the values as I run through this. Again, sorry guys, my computer will not support both my scope and the meter at the same time. Okay, so up in the uh, upper right hand corner, you guys should be able to see the meter. Let me double check that I have connection here. Do I? Yes, okay. So you guys can at least see what I'm seeing. Uh, let me see, this side is the shorted side and this side here I do believe is still good. Yes, it is. And so you're, high, you're going to have a high low side on each one. So I've got 16K, um, high, high, and then this should be low. 16K, 16K, and 8K. So 4 and 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So one, two, three, and one, two, three. Ah, uh, yes. So they're doing three and three. So the first three here, you'll see that we're at 16K, 16K, and then the next three is 8K, 9K, as it charges the capacitor. So, so I'm looking for 16 and eight. So one, two, three, one, two, three. So this is the, gonna be the first set here, eight, nine, eight and then 16 yep and then 16 all right so this side is good here so what i'm looking for is 8k and 16k and that's with the ground the black terminal of the meter going to the uh gate Huh, 29 ohms. Well, 29 ohms. So we're going to find one here that's going to have a dead short. There it is, 1.54 ohms. So 29 ohms. 1.5. 33 ohms. So we're going to find another one here. Remember, these are in sets of three. 33. 33 and of course those are shorted because it actually burnt the traces up which is no big deal because you know we're good at repairing traces so I'm just going to cut this out real quick
yeah, plus minus 5%. Well, it could actually be more than that. It depends on how long you sit there on the uh, on the transistor as it charges up the uh, capacitor. So, yeah, thirty three. 33, 33, it's like I'm just going to pull all these out, of course that's shorted, um, and I do believe, hopefully I ordered enough, 12, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, yes. I uh, diagnosed this board quite a while ago actually. Uh, and uh, I I order these parts and then they come in boxes and I'm like, well, what did I order these 59 and 30s for? And then it's as I go through the repairs, oh, that's where it's for. And I ordered 12 of these, so I must have already known that I had a full bank uh, that was shorted. So oh, and just to let you know, guys, these uh, MIC these 44. 52 ZTs, uh, I had to get through Windsource because, of course, they're not available anywhere. I think Windsource may still have those. And if you guys have any uh, idea or know of, like, Mauser, DigiKey, or Arrow that's got them on hand, uh, let me know. I need to get some more in. Um, what are the power supply and output? That model numbers. Uh, the outputs for this uh, 17K are the 59 and 30s. And the power supply is a good question. Probably, mm, if I had to guess, mm, 064s? I don't know. Um, I didn't pull any clips on the power supply. I can sure go check for you, though, if you'd like. Huh. What, Mike? You had someone calling you names on Sam's stream because you like JL Audio? Eh, that's That goes in right in line with um, I don't like to do live streams on Phoenix Gold amplifiers uh, because you get those Phoenix Gold people that uh, like to try to tell me that I'm doing it right or wrong. So I just avoid that kind of situation. If I've spent too much time getting this channel to where it is, so I don't need anyone dragging it down. Where's my tweezer? So I'm just going to go through and pull these out real quick. Oh, and Mike, um, Remember too, I left you all those notes for you in that uh, in the board for the repair of your amplifier. That'd be like someone uh, saying they like lead-free solder and then someone giving them a bad time for saying such a thing. Me, I can't stand lead-free solder at all whatsoever. It, it'll plug up your desoldering gun so quick. But I understand, you know, the reasoning why they use lead-free. So when you guys are desoldering these uh, bigger amplifiers, 
try not to pull on them too hard as you're uh, desoldering these because you, you'll pull the top of the via right off the board. Oh, and you hear that sound? That's the uh, desoldering gun saying, hey, I'm full of lead-free solder. Yeah. Again, I do apologize for being a little bit behind today. I was going to do this earlier, but I woke up late. Kind of a kind of a rough night. Oh, let's see here. Yeah, let's be. Yes, I can't stand it. Uh, can't stand lead-free solder. So there's nothing like some uh, the old Kester 6040. I've been using that for well, I've been using that Kester. What is this stuff? The Kester? Yeah, the Kester 44. I've been using it for oh gosh, since 20. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, twenty, twenty, twenty-two. Yeah, since twenty fifteen, I think twenty sixteen. Twenty. I've been using that forty-four. So great solder. It's not overly expensive. I think uh, my my school I'm getting for thirty-six dollars. And you know me, I don't charge by the hour, I charge by the job, so uh, the charge of the job is really what covers the uh, spendable items, such as thermal paste and solder and stuff, so... Oh, and I got my order of twenty-four and forties in today. Took a month. So I have a customer that's been waiting very patiently for the twenty-four and forties to show up. They're in, though, so I can get to his board uh, soon. Let's see. Can we see this without getting too much glare from the lights? Let's get right on down in here. So, that's what happens when you... Short out the output of the amplifier while the amplifier is running. Oh, what do I see here? Oh, that's not good. I wish I had a close-up camera right about now, a super close-up camera, because what I would show you guys is this right here. When this transistor, when this transistor failed, it took out this trace right here. And which goes, uh, it's coming from an inductor, goes all the way back over to the power supply. Huh. Well, that got hot. So it took out the trace right there. Typical output failure. I see that's some good solder back in 2017 when I started my build up. Oh, yeah, so Schneider came from the. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I am falling behind. Hey, I just really discovered uh, quality server makes a huge difference. Uh, 
Oh, hold on. Let me back here for just a second here, guys. Uh, Kester, 6037, 6037, safety, safety. I wouldn't pay that. Could, uh, I would. Uh, here, I think 6037. Yes, quality solder does make a huge difference. Hey, I just got the AB amps I've been working on. I always get amount of DC voltage on all the speaker outputs. Possible cause of that. That's going to be your pre-drivers. Your, uh, you're going to have some emitter followers that are before your output transistors that are going, you're probably going to have a short or leaking in one of those, which is going to pull the output transistor either high or low. Uh, let's see here, the stuff that brings in. Your first Alpine PDX. Oh, have fun with that. That's another amplifier I try to stay away from is Alpine. Uh, they also have a uh, topology that can be somewhat hard to follow. So there's certain amplifiers that I will take in for repair and certain amplifiers that I won't take in for repair. Oh, that trace is burnt there too. Oh my gosh, this is going to be a fun board to repair. Oh no, that's the one I already pointed out. Oof, okay. Um, kicker, there's some kicker boards I won't touch. There's some Rockford Fosgate boards that I won't touch. I just don't have time to sit there and try to reverse engineer all their stuff uh, since, you know, manufacturers won't give us schematics. I, if I uh, like the slow time, like in the winter time or fall when I'm a little slower, I'll, I'll take in some amplifiers that I have to do some reverse engineering on and get them done, of course. But I just, uh, this time of year, I just do not have the time to take on any amplifiers that I have to do some uh, reverse engineering on. So have fun with that Alpine. If you have time, it's great. Learn all that you can about it and take good notes. Something I don't do. I'm very bad about taking notes. All right, so let's see here. There are some Alpines, though, that I have repaired uh, that don't have the nasty topology as some of the other ones do. Uh, some Alpines are actually designed in a simplistic way. That's why when I uh, get someone that's wanting to send an amplifier in, I'll ask them if they're willing to send a picture of it, because that'll tell me a lot uh, whether I'll work on it or not. Oh, and hey guys, you remember uh, yesterday uh, that uh, Maxonics board that I was working on that wasn't getting drive, even though I swapped, changed out the uh, drive card? Guess what it was? It was the uh, the TVS diode on the low side rail. So, yeah. Uh, another TVS. Transient voltage surge suppressor diode failure. I wish it wasn't failed, it was leaking. So it was allowing some negative rail to pass, which was dragging down the uh, the input signal to the card, which was keeping the 072 from creating its square wave. So, yeah. Fun facts there. Uh, let's see here. Burn traces. You're worrying me now? <laughs> well, don't worry. Yeah, just take your time. Uh, if you have a scope, just know your scope well. And uh, just remember, if I don't know if it's a class A, B, um, or a class D. Just uh, as long as you understand the topology of the what you're working on, um, give it a shot. Uh, you know, up and isn't blue. Believe in yourself. You can fix them. Oh, yeah. You can fix anything if you're willing to put the time into it. And knowing the scope is absolutely critical in having, you know, repairs that don't take months to do. 
where do I start? It looks weird uh, to me compared to the Infinity Kappa K600 I repaired. Oh, if you made it through an Infinity Kappa, then uh, you may you may be well on your way into being able to fix an Alpine. That's for sure. Uh, uh, hey, six oh, hey, hey, good. Thanks for dropping in. A lot of guys here today. Uh, thanks for your support. I really do appreciate it. Uh, as I build this channel up. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. I'm here. Uh, can I start with a cheapo scope? Honestly, I would highly advise against running a cheaper scope. I really would. Right here. This guy right here. This is a Rigol, the DS1054Z. It's a four channel scope. I think you can still get them for under $400. Uh, if you can find a deal on them, you may be able to get them in the low 300s or a super sale at the high 200s i'm not quite sure i don't remember what we paid for it so um but it has been just a phenomenal scope uh, for me and i don't know if you can kind of see it right there i do have an analog scope uh, that i use for my uh, transistor matching so uh yeah a scope is just an essential tool to have uh when I, when I, oh when i open an alpine lost first thing you do a very first thing you do is you check for shorts check your output transistors check uh check your uh, power supply transistors if you don't have any shorts uh give it some power and see if you have deep drive I'm just going to get your the meter back up here before I get too sidetracked to make sure I'm still showing. So let's see here. Whoop, backwards. Let me check my resistance values here. So 16K from gates uh, to source. 16K, 16K, 8K. Remember how I said earlier, we're looking for 16K and we're looking for 8K based on the other side of the board. That's still good. Uh, 8K. So what you're doing is you're checking the resistance. Remember, all your gate resistors are still in place. All your drive topology is still in place. So you're checking the resistance by between your gate and your source. And if you find a value that's not what you're looking for, then you know there's a problem in your gate drive. So as I go down, I'm just checking. So there's my 16 and my 16 and my 8K, 8K. Hopefully I'm not going too fast. I can't see the meter on the screen while I'm doing this at the same time because I got a wire in the way. Uh, but you can see the values. So I feel pretty confident that the ICs have survived. Otherwise, you would show another low uh, resistance value. Remember, things usually short to a low value or completely open. most times i mean you had there's of course all different situations you can run across uh, but most situations so we got what do we have we have 22 ohm gate resistors and we have a pull down at each one of what are these 10k i'm blind i can't really see so 8.3 so are probably 10k pull downs brown black black so one zero zero and orange so yeah we're 10k pull downs with your 22 ohm gate resistors so what i do is i check the gate resistor across the transistors that have failed well drastically failed um, just to make sure that the gate resistors aren't open because if you have an open gate resistor and you go to fire the board back up that transistor will get smoking hot quick
22 ohms. So all our gate resistors are looking good. It's rare for the pull downs to open. It would have to take a just a drastic failure for a pull down to open. So yeah, those pull downs are still good. So I do have a little bit of trace repair I got to do right there. Oh, let's see here. Anyone looking for? Uh, let's see here. Yes, that's like what Brett's saying. You, you would rather spend money on a better scope and be happy. That's probably one of the biggest complaints that I hear from people is their scope, their image quality, their signal quality. Uh, you got to have a clean signal. You got to be able to see a clean signal when you're working on especially like class a b amplifiers you need to make sure your sine waves are clean and if you have a dirty front end on your scope you're not going to know if you have you know uh emitter follower problems uh, you're just not going to see it as well so you need a clean signal i mean if you want to go cheap i would just get a, an analog you know an old tektronix scope and and start with that at least then you have a uh you know, a screen, a phosphor screen that will give you a clean, clean image. Uh, yes. Well, what does floating mean? Ah, uh, yeah. That's a very good question. All right. Here, let me show you real quick. So, you guys will notice on your leads... Uh, if I had a lead, I don't have one around. Oh, yeah, I do. So, you'll hear me say that I have a floating power supply or an isolated power supply. So, you have your, you have your clip, your ground clip. And if your scope is isolated from your power supply, you know, you can you can probe around without having any worries about uh causing a ground loop which can be real drastic if you're working on dc voltages that are tremendously high but you can you can have your uh ground clip clipped to the reference point of what you're trying to measure i should say now if i were to fire up like my 50 amp uh, regulated power supply over there that is not floating. It's it's not isolated. It's it's bonded, and I go and hook up my ground probe to the amplifier, and then probe with my probe. Well, it shorts the rail to earth ground. So yes. Frequency and voltage, and you know, and there's different kinds of voltages too, guys. You got your peak to peak, you have your RMS, and you got to remember too. There's there's different voltages uh, that you're going to be seeing on your scope settings. So let me get started on this uh, trace repair real quick here. Sorry for the glare of the lights. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to scrape off the, the board here. Get rid of their solder mask here. Put a little bit of flux on that exposed copper. That exposed copper, when you, uh, depending on your environment that you're in, if you go and scrape it down, 
uh, and you don't cover it up with something like flux, you could get an oxi an oxidized layer starting to form on it. It just makes it real fair to solder to. So let me fire up my good old Hacko soldering iron here. The FX888 soldering iron. And let me get my copper. Uh, where are we at here? Uh, da, 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 da. 20 megahertz is good enough for most car audio. Yes, 20 megahertz is just fine. You're not going to get, you're not going to see anything really above. Uh, if you see anything above 100 kilohertz, there's a problem in the drive. Uh, for the most part, I don't think I've come across any amplifiers that are switching above 100 kilohertz. I I, I don't know. I kind of vaguely remember thinking of something about 120 kilohertz, but I could be thinking of something else. So it's very rare you're going to see anything uh, above that. So a uh, a 20 megahertz scope is just fine. It's like these Rigals, this 1054 is, what is this? Is it a 50 megahertz? Yeah, it's a 50 megahertz scope. Um, would I ever need to measure to 50 megahertz? No, never. Not, not for, not for this kind of work. Uh, what does Hertz mean matter for di diagnosis? What does the Hertz matter for diagnosis? You're talking about the, the frequency of the scope itself. Uh, so let's say you had a scope that's only good to 20 kilohertz. Well, you have switching in class D amplifiers that is higher than 20 kilohertz, so you would never see it. Oh. You have to make sure that your scope is still, you know, within the specifications of the frequencies that you're actually testing. Like most power supplies run at, what, 27 kilohertz. So you have to make sure your scope is uh, at least good to 27 kilohertz. Oh, let me find my solder. There's my solder. So I'm just going to lay down just a little bit of solder on this trace here. Because we're going to put that trace back together. And you know what? You know what transformers are great for? Wire. Transformers are great for wire. Could be a little thick. I could probably go with a thinner. Yeah. Go with thinner wire. Yeah, I'll go with thinner wire. Um, so this transformer had a primary, a primary, a secondary, and a feedback. So that gave me three different sizes of wire from this transformer. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna solder this little copper wire right into place here. Quick and easy. like that and then of course you just take your knife here pop it right off and of course we take our trusty q-tips and clean up the flux I know one day I'll have a camera here that'll be a little bit better so you guys can see what I'm doing. 
I, I hate it that you guys can barely see what I'm doing. So uh, I do, please do excuse me for that technical issue. And I'm just going to use my meter here and make sure that I have uh, successfully soldered that copper wire in. So like I said, it comes back to L3 over here to an inductor. L stands for inductor for uh, you guys that are new to this. Uh, so from the inductor back to the pin on the back side of the board here, we are showing a good, nice, complete path again. 0.25, because if you hold your meter leads together, 0.19, so almost a 0.2. So that's just the resistance, of course, of the full path itself. 0.26. So I got that soldered back together. Uh, what else do we have here? Do we have any burnt vias? So it did take just a small spot of this uh, trace off. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to remove the solder mask. with the nasty fingers down a chalkboard scraping sound. And then again, I'm gonna put some flux on that copper. Just like that. And uh, when I go to put the new transistor in, what I'll do is I will solder the uh the trace to the leg of the transistor because it didn't blow the trace completely back from the transistor itself but just a small little corner of it is missing um, which is no big deal because what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that when we solder this it's going to solder at least it looks like about it no oh, eighth of an inch back up on the primary trace otherwise all these other traces look pretty decent Oh, what do we got here? So, um, I got this. That means the grounds aren't tied together. Yeah, yeah. You don't want your grounds tied together. Um, I couldn't stress that more. Who has a good video on that? Uh, Dave. No, is it Dave the EV blog? I think Dave might have a video on that. Who else has that? There's a couple videos out on YouTube that you can watch about scope grounding. Uh, between your isolated, non-isolated uh, grounding of your scope. I mean, some bad things can happen if you're uh, grounded improperly, especially on these amps that have just these massive amounts of capacitive current behind it. You don't want to do that. Uh, let's see here. Um, I thought it was just square wave, uh, twisted. Um, I thought it was just square wave or not square wave. Um, square wave for class D with no modulation, I should say, uh, is what you're looking for. But there's a lot of variances of that square wave that you want to keep an eye out for, which I think I went over yesterday in a live stream is especially on your power supply. You don't want any overshoot, undershoot, and you don't want a lot of ringing. Uh, ringing will cause heat. Well, overshoot and undershoot would cause heat too, but you don't want a lot of noise on your square wave. Uh, let's see here. I thought it was just... Uh, so you float the power supply. Yes, I do. Uh, what are the risks involved with that? There's no risks on that. Um, let me uh, show you. So... Here's my power supply. This is my this is my 10 amp supply. Comes from a 12 volt mm, power supply brick that's right down here. I got a actually got a few of them down here. 
you can see, let me see if I can get up here, see that thing right there for you guys. This here, I can start 98% of every amp I repair with this particular brick. It's a 10 amp, 12 volt. It's current limited. It has a seriously quick short circuit protection circuit in it. Um, I have a two amp down there that I use for the really small amps. Let me see if I can get a better picture here. So there's my two amp supply, which is isolated from uh, earth ground. So this wire here is the uh, remote wire, comes off of a foot switch that I have down on the ground. And of course I have my red marked wire here and my ground wire. So uh, that one there, my two amp, I use with a foot switch, which I use for the smaller amps. Um, I'm getting more used to using my 10 amp supply for these larger amps, because uh, then I don't have to pulse it as much. Some output drives do not like to be pulsed of what I found. So it just depends on uh, the amp. Where was I? I was... Just pre-soldering the front end of this primary trace here. This is the drain, actually. All right, and then from here, we just uh, fit in new transistors. And this is when you hope and pray that they sent you matching transistors. Well, they're three and three. So uh, y you only need three uh, minimum transistors that are matched. I mean, that could be that could be heated topics. Some people will say you don't need to be matched. Some people will say you need to be matched. But anyone that understands resistors uh, would know why you really should have matched transistors. All right. Type 4s. Oh, yeah. My most favorite amp of all time is a Type 4 based amplifier. Oh, man. I know those things inside and out, upside down, all around. I've spent so much time reverse engineering a Type 4 board. It uses the 74H CO2s. Uh, just the way the logic works on those, you have to understand how those uh, gates work uh, on those ICs. That's the best way to understand a Type 4, so. There you go, Tektronix 2205, 40 megahertz analog. Perfect, perfect. As long as it works and it's still somewhat calibrated, yeah, that's perfect. Is there a reason for fluid running equipment isn't standard practice? Uh, is there a reason? Because it's not... I don't know, what, what would you say? Not politically or technically safe because uh, you have no protection going back for short circuits. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. That's something I would ask Dave, personally. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Dave there at EV Blog. He's a great guy. He's a he's someone that just knows a lot of stuff. All right. Here's another tip of the day, guys. When you are working on these amps that have those dreaded clips that hold these against the heat sink, always make sure you put the transistors in at the right height. I uh I I got a little too 
relaxing what I was doing on an amp and I set the transistors too high. So it ended up the transistors would were shorting out against the clip. Of course, the clip is grounded to the case of the amp. So, ugh, what a nightmare. So these transistors are pretty much uh, all the way down. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop all these transistors back in. So it looks like they're about an eighth of an inch up. So what I do is I slide the transistor in and then I bend out the legs. Let's see if I can let's see if I can do this here. There we go. So what I do is I'll slide the transistor in and I'll just slightly bend the legs outward. That allows me to flip the board over without the transistors falling out. So, I can scoot them down just a little bit to get my eighth inch. Perfect. Perfect, 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 perfect. And then of course, you wanna make sure they're straight too. Once you solder these things in place, they're pretty much there. Uh, you, to correct them, you have to desolder them all again. So what I'll do is I'll just take my long line of solder here, and I will just solder one leg in place. course using the desoldering tool to resolder the transistors. And just like that. So by soldering the one leg it allows me to, to do the fine adjustments that I'm looking for on the transistor. Make sure they're straight. And what I'll do is I'll use the edge of the board as a guide to tell me if they're straight. And remember that on these on these boards, when you go to slide them back in the heat sink, they, the transistors have to be tipped inward just a little bit. So I'll tip them in just a little bit. Don't go too far because when you go to bend them back against the heat sink, if you bend them back too far and then solder them in place, you'll put some stress on those legs. And you don't want to stress those legs out because you'll end up with broken legs. And then I just go through and re-solder all the legs back in place. And then keeping in mind too, I had those two uh, traces that were uh, damaged just a little bit.
which we're getting closer to. Just like that, soldered in place. I found a BK Precision 2 channel 20 megahertz reverse for 99 bucks. There you go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Again, as long as it works. Uh, sweet. Let's see here. Uh, that should work great. Just to grab the comment. I didn't realize that there was more to it than just reading a square of it, like when setting gain. S uh, setting the gains? Mm, you're, I think that's more in the lines of install business there. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't install, I just repair. Uh, I will help people if they, uh, are looking for help, but I, uh, I have nothing to do with, uh, installs. Cause you know, uh, installs, what happens is People always want more after the initial first install. And uh, they like to uh, start turning up gains. And then when the uh, sub fails or the amplifier fails they like to come back to you and say that your stuff has failed well it's not it's not quite how it works so i had uh, a car audio business back in 2005 it was called wired audio and uh that's when i learned real fast about car installation and what uh what people expect from you when it comes to having a, a car stereo system all right now there's those two that i need to fix which is this one and this one. So let's see here. Let me So these two right here that I have tipped back are the two that I need to uh, do a little TLC here on the trace, which is really easy to do since I pre-soldered the trace. What I do is I just make sure that it goes solders right to the leg of the transistor just like that and now the final thing i do is i double check the resistance values again after all the transistors are put back in now remember it goes back to what, what we're looking for are the resistance values Which was, what was it? 16 and 8, right? Again, it's going back to my bad note-taking. As I drag my leads across all this thermal paste. I know I fix amps, but I can't stand thermal paste. Uh, what do we got here? 16K. So the first three sets should be 16K. And then there's our 8K. So eight, so it's going to go 16 for the first three, 8K for the next three. Because remember, you're going to have a uh, a low side drive, which is going to be a drive that rides your negative rail. And then you're going to have your, which is going to pump your high side drive, which is where you're going to get your uh, your full railed rail. Eight, 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 and then sixteen. 
There it is. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for. So the resistance values show good. Now, don't get me wrong. You could still have leaky transistors. You could have leaking gates. Uh, you could have all sorts of leaking issues. But again, 99% of the time, a resistance value will point you in the direction of either having a problem or not. Um, and just by reading what these are showing me, this is all of the new bank here, just by the based on the reading of those uh, the resistance values telling me that it would be okay to slide this back into the heat sink, bolt the thing back up, which I love these boards for. Thanks guys for doing this because you can slide these boards into two separate halves. Um, I believe it'll slide back together and be just fine. I mean, sure, you may, may or may not have a problem with the 2184, but I highly doubt it. So, luckily the owner, when this happened, he pulled the power just like that, just instantly. Otherwise, the output of this thing would have just kept on cooking. Uh, the protection circuits on these aren't the quickest thing in the world. So, um, but yeah, that's where this board is. Let's see here. Questions, questions. I would suggest learning on type four amps. Oh yeah. Oh, you want to learn about some, uh, logic and be behind, uh, class D switching type four boards. Uh, sorry guys. Uh, it's hard for me to work and then keep up on questions here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I found a BK. Yep. Uh, just like one. We'll just click. Oh, sweet. I'm seeing. Tell you about the, so I taught myself how to build drones and actually repaired a flight controller. Nice. Nice. I did a lot of RC flying, um, for a while, a little while. And then, uh, I had a little, unfortunate circumstance with my back and it just kind of fell to the side so uh let's see here i have to tell myself i've suggested learning type 4 amps yes oh would type 4 be class d yes type 4 is class d uh let's see here how how would you best explain the difference between a class d and a class a b um A class AB amplifier uses NPN and PNP transistors to take your sine wave and swing it above and below a negative, not a negative, a zero volt reference. Kind of like the center line of your scope. Um, that's probably the most general way to explain a class a b there's a lot more to it but it's kind of in my opinion it's hard to explain to someone how a class a b works and then have everyone in the group understand it uh, so again you have your transistors that work either in the negative side of the world or the positive side of the world and that's how you get your sine wave class d switching um is you can think of it as an on or off state. Your square wave is going to be high, which will be your on. It'll be zero, back down to the zero reference, which is going to be off, and then over and then back up. And then you're going to have your, your dwell time in between those square waves. And then in between those square waves, you'll see your signal modulating. So a class D is a switching circuit. It's not, some people say it's not logic, but it is kind of logic. Uh, class D is switching on and off, on and off, on and off, real fast, really super fast. So class AB is not. Class AB is just taking a signal and bringing it above or below the zero volt reference. Uh, I'm sure that though Todd has heaps more knowledge than I do. Oh, Daniel, that was pretty. There's tons of help out there. Yeah. Um, I will show you guys. Uh, 
I will show you guys real quick. Here is my Type 4. Mm, it's hard to get. Here's my Type 4 boards. It's in this styrofoam because it doesn't have... <clears throat> my only gripe is no pull-down resistors on the rails. So when you charge this thing up, it stays charged. That's why it's in this. And it says live right here. <laughs> um, but this is a Type 4 board. And this is what I use to teach people how to understand the uh, circuitry of a Type 4 board. So if you ever have questions of a Type 4 board, let me know. I will do my best to help explain it to you. I love Type 4. Again, uh, where's the uh, audio pipe? Audio pipe is Type 4 all day long, except for their new ones. Uh, they Audio pipe does have some Brazilian style boards out now. A, B, A, B, C, and D. Yeah, so you're going to have biased, non-biased. You're going to have uh, D, E. You're also going to have a... Uh, I had just sent out a US amps, a, type, a class D, E amplifier. Uh, there's just all sorts of different topologies for amplifiers. Yeah, all of my earlier videos are type 4. Uh, that was when I first started amplifier repair. I, uh, the Type 4s really threw me for a loop because of the 74 HCO2 ICs. Um, I didn't understand uh, logic gates uh, very well. And by just hours and hours of looking at data sheets and reading the truth tables, you start to learn and understand how those logic gates work. Uh, it takes two signals to make either an on state or an off state. And that is how the 74HCO2 creates your square wave drive going to each half of that amplifier. I don't know anything about AB. AB is tough to learn. Uh, I get a new reader scope for a digital type. I know, but what is type 4? That's class D, correct? Um, okay, for all you guys out there, if you don't have Perry's guide, you need to get a hold of Perry. Perry Babin. Uh, he's on DIY Audio. Get a hold of him or bcae1.com or you just type in Google Amplifier Repair Guide. I do believe Perry's guide comes up. Get that guide. Hands down the best resource you can have for amplifier repair, beginning amplifier repair. He doesn't have a lot on the Brazilian style boards, but uh, as soon as you start understanding uh, class D switching, you'll have the Brazilian boards down too. So Perry's guide. Yes, my conda. My conda, that's, that's right, that's right. Hey Mike, if I if you see anything um, oddball popping up, uh, I think you and Damon there, if you if you can keep an eye out for me, uh, I much appreciate that. Uh, so let's see, you're talking a lot. Sorry, I talk a lot. Hey, no problem. I, I talked to you. Okay, so I got the class D explanation, but you lost me on class A. Class A, class A is a amplifier circuit that I do believe is unbiased. Is it, or is it always? It's always biased. Um, I'd have to go back. It's class A is uh, actually quite rare. So, all right, I'm going to kick this board aside and let's grab that. All right. Oh, look at that. What are those lines that goes across the screen there? It says, hey, it doesn't like the lighting. Uh, lighting and equipment is just an absolute nightmare. I have a question about the Type 4. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, don't confuse me. <laughs> I've been screen... Sh oh. Uh, get the guide and you will know. Yes, yes, get the guide, get the guide. 
100%. Get a hold of Perry. I... Perry will set you up. Uh, Perry does have a section of the guide that you can uh, view or go over for free online. Uh, but I highly recommend the version that you will be buying from him. I still, to the day, go back and reference his stuff. Because he's got, he's got all sorts of stuff in there. Schematics uh, that uh, you will definitely need at some point if uh if you don't ask people you know like on the facebook groups information i'm not a huge fan of posting stuff but uh yeah now i will be honest guys i don't know really uh much what's going on with this this is a uh, B2 08 Osprey amplifier that somebody uh, said they had previously brought to someone to have it repaired. But the crazy thing is, is there is a trace... Oh, man, let's see. Can we uh, can we get a view of this trace? Mm. There is a trace. Let me get right down in here. Yeah, you see this dark line right here, and you can see it kind of scooting uh, right underneath these capacitors. Well, that trace is it's missing. It's gone. I mean, it it's blown right off the board. And it looks like it heads back to the power supply card. So my primary goal is to pull the board. Oh my gosh, look at all these screws I got to undo. I'm sorry, guys. I know I should have probably done this earlier. Um, and see if... I can determine where this trace goes without having to pull these rail capacitors. I would rather not pull the rail capacitors. But it looks like it comes up over here. Yeah, kind of a mess. Not sure what happened to this board, but this is the next one. Uh, so let me see what kind of board are these guys using here. So they're using uh, oh, there's just two one one zeros. Ah, that's an interesting setup. Almost uh, the two one one zero, almost like a. Uh, Almost like the same style as Orion uses. So you have an auxiliary power supply here. And then you're going to have your two uh, output drive cards. Is this full bridge? Uh, is, the, is that the question for this amplifier? Um, This is going to be two half bridge amplifiers. So I don't know. Let me see here. Uh, have you all watched Sam's explanation between a full bridge and a half bridge amplifier? So we have two half bridge amplifiers going on here. Is that what I'm seeing? This is the first uh, B2 Osprey that I have ever I've ever opened up. So
Ah, there we go. So class A is biased around the Q point within the middle of its bloodline. Okay, so so it's constantly, and that's why class A's run so warm, because they're always constantly being biased uh, based on the output, right? Uh, let's see here. Well, we got to get this thing out of here. That's not going to be very fun. But hey, you know. Let's see if we can uh, figure out what how this uh, how this board ticks. So, um, so yeah, if y'all uh, are can you know don't know what a full bridge or half bridge is, uh, look up uh, Sam's video. He's got one uh, that that does explain the difference between a full bridge and a half bridge. The easiest way to know is uh, where the negative speaker terminal goes. That's the best way to really determine uh, the full bridge versus half bridge. So this may be set up in a full bridge style. Because you're going to have one side that's going to be inverted 180 degrees out of the other side, probably. Because I'm not seeing that the uh, negative speaker terminal is bonded to the secondary. It's to the, uh, hold on, let me see here. So this side is negative. Let me, which I doubt it's going to be, uh, Oh, it is. Okay. Well, so on the screen there, you'll see the negative speaker terminal and the secondary side of your transformers. You're going to get 0.18 ohms, which is... Secondary of the transformers it is center tap, I should say. Center tap of the secondaries is your speaker negative terminal. So now, ask yourself, is this a full bridge or a half bridge amplifier? Oh, where was I? Oh, I was taking this thing apart. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I have a pretty quick method of pulling clips off of uh amplifiers which i i would probably much rather pull clips than undo a bazillion screws uh because i do have some pretty bad arthritis that i deal with so and i don't like to use uh power tools on these because sometimes um, if you if they're tight and you hit it with an impact to pull these screws out, sometimes it'll take the aluminum right with it. So I like to be able to feel uh, the tension, how much tension is on the uh, on the tool. So hey Jesse, hey. Thank you for joining in there. We're just pulling apart a B2 here real quick. Looks like this B2 got a little toasty on the auxiliary power for some reason. I don't see very many auxiliary power failures. So the question is, is what has failed on the auxiliary power to make it short out like that? Uh, any hints there, guys, or any clues? Remember, this is uses the 2110 ICs uh, to drive the outputs. There are no, let's see here, there are no transistors. There's no buffers in between. So the 2110s are directly driving the transistors. 
What? Oh, no, no, there are. No, I see them. They're on the card. Yeah, just like an Orion. So there are some buffer transistors on the card itself, but there are no... Uh, there are no signs of failed uh, buffer transistors. Hmm, that's interesting. Luckily, this board just pulls up and then doesn't slide out. So I told the owner of this that I would bring it in and check it out, even though he had somebody already try to repair it. It makes me wonder, did they run a jumper on the bottom to replace this trace? If so, and it doesn't start still, well, there may be a, there may be another issue somewhere. The most concerning thing that I see is I see a sp little spot. I don't know if you guys can see it or not. There is a spot right here. Let me. Uh, yeah, there is a spot right here that is a burn spot coming from underneath the auxiliary transformer so that could be a bad sign if the auxiliary transformer shorted out eh, that's a possibility of why the trace would burn up so if the uh let's see here well they have a transistor that drives the transformer So once I get all these retainers pulled here, I'm going to check the continuity. Uh, across the transistor that drives the transformer there. So I got all the retainers pulled. I've got more thermal paste on me as usual. Let's check that real quick. Let's check this transistor. Twenty-three ohms. Oh yeah, this is not looking very promising. Twenty-three point one three ohms. Uh, what kind of transistor is that? Is that, a, is that a bipolar or is that a MOSFET? That is a, is it a BJT? Oh no, it's IRFB. Oh, what is this? IRFB C30? All right, guys, what's an IRFB C30? Yeah, more data sheets. IRFB C30. So it is a MOSFET, so gate and source has a resistance value of 23 ohms, but do they, are they using a resistor to pull, pull the gate back down? I'm not sure. Uh, not until I get the board out flip it around. Hey, uh, hey there, Damon. Thanks for joining in. Just the guy I think about every time when I've been trying to get this Rockford Fosgate, this 800, I think it's an 800A2 up and running. Oh my gosh, I tell you what. I am not a fan of Rockford Fosgate at all whatsoever. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for coming by. Got to get some chores done. Yeah, yeah. You know, the chores are repairing amplifiers. That's uh, that's the chore.
So what uh, what transistors this use? This uses the IXYS, the IXFH 44N50s for the outputs. Whew, that's a mouthful there. And then the power supply uses the IRP1405s. Yeah, that's a, uh, that really, really reminds me of, uh, the HCCA, uh, design. Hey, Don. Hey, hey, thanks for joining in. Hope things are going well for you. Yeah, yeah. Ask Damon about, uh, he's, I don't know, he's, uh, in my opinion, he's the guy to talk to when it comes to Rockford Fosgate. I just, when I get more time, I'll have more figured out, but Time, of course, uh, sometimes can be the hard part. Yeah, B2. This is, uh, this really, really looks like a uh, HCCA style board. Okay, guys, here's a true true or false for you. Thermal paste. Does more, does thermal paste have a resistance value based on thickness? There you go. Let's see who, uh, let's see who answers that. Does thermal paste have a resistance value based on thickness? Whew. I think this has been a little toasty because this thermal paste that's on it is a little thick. I think it's been hot. You can always tell when someone has had their amplifier toasty warm because the thermal paste gets pretty solid. All right. Is this thing ready to come out now? Uh, no, because they have the board screwed down. Of course, all good manufacturers will screw, screw their board down. Right? Uh, Don, yes, has to. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I like about Don. Don's a great guy, too. Uh, I would rather work on Rockford's than all this new class D junk. Yeah, yeah, that's why we have you, Damon. You are the man when it comes to Rockford. That's... Yeah, we need to have a tutorial of how you uh, go about diagnosing your Rockford Fosgate amplifiers. I I got I was working on that 800 uh, E2 yesterday, uh, last night, and I finally got the one side working. Um, and then and then I went to go repair the other side. And once I repaired the other side, the first side quit working again. So, uh, I just, uh, not my favorite amplifier to work on. This, this Class D stuff is kind of like no-brainer stuff. Uh, some faults can be interesting, but otherwise this, this stuff is pretty straightforward.
Oh yes, I can see where somebody has done some trace repair. Oh my goodness. All right, hold on just a second, guys. This thing's pretty heavy. All right. Whew, goodness. Uh, let's see how's how there. Uh, videos in progress. Got three fuckers all the way from Australia. Oh my gosh. Now that's quite a ways to get aboard from. Ugh, I do not like this. Uh, too tall. Ah, uh, that's better. All right. Ah, what are these lines on my camera? Uh, can I fix this? How do I fix this? Do I do this? No. Do I do this? No. Uh, I don't know how to fix that. Mm, it doesn't like the light or what? Yeah. All right. So let's see here. I don't know how to stop that. How do I stop that? I don't stop that. All right, guys. I need camera help. How do I solve this? Hmm. Wow. I don't like that one bit. But do you guys see what I see here? You can see where someone had repaired. These traces? What in the world do they do here? Hold on. Now I have to inspect someone else's work. Thermal paste. Got thermal paste all over me. Uh, let's see here. Well... I can see that they rebuilt the traces uh, that burn up, but what they didn't do was fix the trace on the top of the board. Okay, well... Let me, uh, put this back around here. So the problem is going to be the trace that's missing. Which, I don't know where it goes because it disappears underneath a rail capacitor. Uh, uh, let's see here, videos and burgers. Uh, Don, do you completely clean all the insulators and heat sinks, all components mounted to it, and apply a new thermal? Yes, yes I do, absolutely, 100%. Uh, every amplifier gets all the old thermal paste comes off, new thermal paste goes on, and I don't put it on a mile thick. Uh, I get so many boards in that the thermal paste is just piled on, and uh, you know, you, you're not doing it any good by putting so much thermal paste on because it does have a resistance value. So it's all about heat transfer. Uh, all right, guys, how am I going to fix this? 
So the trace that I'm after comes off of R587 right here, goes around, goes underneath this rail capacitor, and I can see the trace where it burned up between this capacitor and this capacitor, but the trace burn off right at the base of this capacitor. So what's the only logical thing to do? Uh, pull the capacitor. Oh man, I really don't want to do that, but we're going to pull it. How's that sound? Let's pull it out of there. Yeah, <laughs> yep, yeah, that's right, Cliff. Remove the cap. Oh, burn up. Yeah, Damon, it, um, it burn up. So let's get this rail cap out of here. Which one is it? It is... That guy right there. Now, rail capacitors can be kind of a nightmare to, uh, to get out. Ah, see these dark lines? That's where the better camera is going to come in, right? Seriously. What causes that? Uh, let's see here. Uh, I go to the rescue, yes. <laughs> did you discharge the rails? No, I did not discharge the rails. Uh, hold on, let me see here real quick. I did not discharge the rails. Because I did not charge this. We're, uh, mm, yeah, mm, okay. And it does have two discharge resistors. So, whew, thanks for bringing that up. You know me, keep safety, keep your fingers out of the rails is like what I like to say. Um, but, uh, yeah, by looking at what's going on here, I don't believe that that uh, is going to be a live rail anyways <laughs> so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take some good solder and i'm going to put it on the old nasty lead free solder the good old FR301 does it again. Oh, and that capacitor just has to be wedged in there, doesn't it? So I will use a little small little screwdriver here just to make sure that the leads are not soldered into the via, which it is nice and free. So now I just got to get the capacitor out of there. Hope I desoldered the right one. Pretty sure I did. Uh, did you show me again now? <laughs> Can you locate it by checking the ohms? Um, yeah, yes, you can locate it by checking the ohms. So when I got this in, uh, I originally pulled the cover off, looked, and I saw the trace. And the trace that I'm after... The trace that I'm after is burn off underneath this capacitor. I just, there's, I've dug down underneath as far as I could go underneath this capacitor and I just cannot uh, get to it to find it over here at the drive cart. I mean, I have tried and tried, so I wish I could, but I cannot. Now, let's see if I can get this glued down capacitor out of there. Of course, it's glued down very nicely. Uh, it is. Uh, it'd be nice if I can just roll this thing out of here. Would be nice. Probably not going to happen, though. 
shoot. Yeah, rail caps. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I think I told my wife about that there, Damon, a, a while ago about the fart gun. <laughs> yeah. I tell you what, it's glued down there pretty good. Mm. It goes somewhere. Yes, it sure does. Um, if I had access to the one side, I, I have a good idea what trace it is. But not guaranteed, I should say, that that's the trace that I'm after. So what I need is I need to get underneath this thing. They've got glue everywhere. So I may have to pull this capacitor just to get to the other one. Just to get to the other capacitor. There it is. I'm thankful that the vias that they use on these boards are aren't so small that you can't uh, wiggle the lead around. Oh, and the rail capacitors on this are 200 volt, 1500 microfarads. Oh, ah, hey, look at that, guys. Ah, oh, all right. Well, now we know what happened. If you have an identical amp in your shop, use it to reference where the tray should go. Yes, exactly. True. If you have an amplifier of the same type, it's a great resource, especially when the manufacturer won't give you a schematic. Ah, which, Cliff, if you're still here, by the way, I have sent an email off to Sound Digital, uh, begging, begging uh, politely for, um, even if they will allow me to sign an NDA, uh, begging them politely if they would like to share some information with me. Well... I can see why this amplifier is not starting. So let's uh, let's bring you down into the adventure of the board. Where is it? Uh, all right. Oh my gosh! Except it's focusing on the wrong thing. Of course, it's that autofocus, right? Of course, it is. What? Oh, hold on. Hold on. That's not exactly what I was at. Let's see here. Doop. Uh, nope. uh, so, as you can see, we have some problems. But what I'm trying to do here real quick is if I can... focus in on the area that I'm trying to show you guys here. Hopefully that's a little bit better. All right, so we had a trace failure underneath the rail capacitor. Uh, this is supposed to be white, so this is all burn up. And the trace that I was trying to hunt down that I couldn't find is right here. That's where it ended. And as you can see, that trace is it's gone. Uh, it's disappeared. So, 
Um, this may be a issue if that capacitor is now bad from shorting out. Uh, I'm not sure if it would be bad or not. Oof. There, let's make it its original color again here real quick so we can see better. All right. There it is. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that's right, Damon. Um, we'll see what Sound Digital says. I, I, I you know, I, all I can do is try. Um, kind of like with Maxonics, it took me, oh gosh, it took me six months probably for them to uh, finally uh, agree through an NDA to even get partial schematics from them. So, I mean, I keep my fingers crossed. I'm, um, we'll see what they say. Um, I told them I have no problem, you know, talking with their engineers or their uh, service departments, uh, whoever, you know, is in charge of that information. I have no problem discussing stuff with them. If they want to know information, more information about me as a business. Uh, so we'll see what they say. I, I doubt they'll give me information, but doesn't hurt to try. I've got several sound digital amps here that I absolutely, it would save so much time if I could just get a schematic. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, this trace is bad. It's really, really bad. Um, I am going to go ahead and pull, uh, the other capacitor that's next to it. I just want to make sure that the traces are still intact. Ah. Must use leaded solder to get rid of lead free. Shoot. Yeah, I don't know. This, uh, I'm wondering if this was a failure from vibration. I mean, how else would a capacitor fail? Uh, um, And wear through, like I'm, just, I'm, it looks like it shorted out to the negative terminal of the capacitor. Shoot. I may have to do a little finessing here with this capacitor. Hold on, guys. Don't lose hope yet. Yeah, this is, uh... This one's glued down quite well. There we go. All right. All right.
right, let's get right back into that. Okay, so I have removed the capacitors that were in the way. Oh, let's see if I get this. You pull. Uh, it burnt them way back, probably under that other cap too. Yeah, Fosgate, sorry, Alpine too. All they have to do is watermark the text name on the schematic. Um, if it gets out, they will know which. Yes, yes. Uh, just like uh, just like Taramps, they mark all my schematics. Then my name is all over. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I have no problem, you know, working with manufacturers to uh, be able to have information. I mean, I, I come like I told them in the emails, you know, I completely understand the R and D, the cost and the time of the R and D behind the information. So. Whew. I will, I'll protect their information, you know, but at the same time, if, if I have an amplifier in front of me here and it has the part numbers clearly marked on it, I will share with my, that information with all you guys. Um, and at the same time, you know, things like the, uh, the MIC 4452s, you know, uh, if I see a driver that's been defaced that people will ask, well, what driver is it? Um, I'll let you know what driver it is, but I'm not, you know. I won't take a schematic from a manufacturer and then and then give it to someone that's you know that at least doesn't work for the manufacturer because usually in the terms of an NDA you can share the schematics with other technicians but you can't share them with the general public so yeah all right well now that I know where all these traces go I would do this from underneath. I would not repair these traces. Oh, was that a via? Oh. Now, who would put a via underneath a rail capacitor? Ah, B2. Well, look at... That is, that's a via. Uh, no wonder I couldn't see uh, an inline, you know, usually when something goes underneath, you can just match up the lines where they go in and out. That's why I couldn't find one coming back out of the capacitor because it's a via underneath the capacitor. You can see it right there. Right there. Yeah, it's a via. So I do believe that's going to be the problem with this board. And it shorted originally because of probably this issue right here. You can see where that trace burnt itself right across that negative terminal of the capacitor. Huh. That's strange because you would think the clearance. Uh, I guess there's not much of a clearance there. Yeah, I don't know. Very interesting failure. So is the capacitor still good? That'll be the question of the day. Let me fire up my little meter here real quick. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, that's the only way I think manufacturers are just uh, using the same topology of amplifiers is anyone can reverse engineer something given enough time. Always discharge your rail capacitor before. Of course it's not charged. I've already had my fingers across it, but I know, where's my proper capacitor tester, right guys? It's right here. Thirteen hundred microfarads. Hey, that's not too bad. This is a rated at fifteen hundred. It came back at thirteen ninety. So 
uh, with an ESR of 0.6 ohms, six tenths of an ohm with a 0.6% loss. Nah, those, those capacitors are just fine. The traces aren't though. So, yeah, I'm going to not run the traces underneath the capacitors. I'm going to clean out all the copper, burnt little sections of copper. I am going to rerun the traces underneath. instead of underneath the capacitors. So grab my marker and let's mark which one goes where. So we have this resistor right here. That resistor goes to this via here. Um, and then we have this via here. Oh, I can already see what happened here. Goes up to this resistor here. One, two, three, capacitor. One, two, three, capacitor. Yeah, okay. So, the tr these traces, <laughs> funny this, so these traces are the rails. So what happens is it looks like it shorted out uh, the positive and negative rail directly. Because one of these goes to one main rail and the other via goes to the other main rail. Well, so positive and negative, so once this capacitor wore through these traces here, it shorted the negative shorted the negative yep to the positive trace ah there we are how funny is that good job there guys hmm. sure did so the negative side here shorted out to this trace, which this trace via goes to the positive side of the capacitor behind it. Yep, that was a dead short across the rails. Oh, now a requo. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm. I don't believe. You know what? I didn't check. That's that's a good one there. That's a good one, Damon. Uh, because what I haven't checked on this amplifier is if we have any shorted uh, power supply or output transistors. So let's go ahead and see what it says. So we got 3.7K. Uh, what do we got here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it would be 5 and 5. Uh, 3.7... 3 3.7, 3.7, 3.7, 3.7, 3.7, 3.7, 3.7, 3.7, 3.7, 3.7, oh no, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, it's 4 and 4, these two are rectifiers, sorry, D for diode, uh, so 3.7, how about drain source, of course you're going to show a capacitor charging, and a capacitor charging. All right, so what did I say it was? We are 3.7K on the outputs. Uh, 3.7, 3.7, 3 3.7, 3.7, and drain source. Good, no shorts on the high side, low side, drain source or gate to source uh, those are rectifiers and then we're going to be uh, 
8.8 on the power supply, 8.8, 8.8, 8 .8. so I'm thinking that this amplifier was just a failure of the capacitor wearing through and shorted out the positive and negative rail at the capacitor so it really wouldn't affect the output it could i'm surprised i mean I guess that was a really quick short because these traces are so small and thin if the traces were much bigger i think it would have overloaded the power supply and then took out the power supply as i get thermal paste all over me um so so yeah i'm just gonna I'm going to do, it's going to be billed as uh, two trace repairs. And I may want to pull that auxiliary transformer, though, because those burn marks coming from underneath that transformer are a little concerning. Um, so it'll be two trace repairs. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the auxiliary transformer. Hold on. I can kind of see down in there. Let's see here. Ah. Well, hopefully the winding's still good on that auxiliary transformer, because I can see where the scorching came from. Hmm. But yeah, I uh, I don't see really any issues in repairing this board. Let's see here. Uh, is there any place to attempt to find schematics for amplifiers? You will not find many amplifiers um, that are going to have schematics. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Unless it's an old amplifier, uh, you're not going to find much. Jesse, sign up and do searches at DIY Audio. Yeah, DIY Audio. And while you're there, hit up Perry. He's a he's a great resource. Uh, Perry may or may not give you some schematics. He does have some some schematics. So my last thing here, I'm just going to check this transformer. And see, make sure that we don't have any damage. To the trans, whoop, to the transformer itself which it just fell out and I didn't really want it to fall out uh, because which way did it go back in? Uh... Oh, good. Whew. I can see the uh, scorch mark. where it uh where it burn up on the board uh oh do we have a burn up transformer winding mm. i do believe we probably do oh yeah um well
this could be uh, bad news for this guy. So let's see here. We're the area of the transformer is right here. And this was the spot I was talking about that I could see uh, is kind of burn up right here. So I knew something underneath the transformer caused this. And well, fortunately, it looks like the windings, you know how the windings, it's kind of hard to see, but you can just see the copper winding coming over the transformer here. Uh, well, it's burn off. It does not go to the post. I mean, I may be able to solder a lead. Yeah, so that one's burn up. And it looks like there's another one here. So this one's burn up also. Well, this will be interesting. I may or may not be able to fix that. Uh, darn. That's bad. That's bad news for the uh, owner of this amplifier. Oh, uh, let's see here. Uh, Perry Wilkie email him. You'll find some nice for Atari amps, by the Sony Alpine, etc. Uh, it's a parts app now. <laughs> it's a parts app. Yeah. Schematics for tar amps. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You Tex. Uh, so. So that's where I'm at with these guys. I need to uh, do some digging around on this transformer. It would be pointless to do all this work if I can't get an auxiliary power supply running. So. This transformer is the make it or break it deal for this uh, amplifier. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Hey, Matt. Hey, thanks for dropping in. Uh, yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice board. Um, it's very, very well built. I mean, this thing is just sturdy as can be i mean everything is glued down just the way i'd expect it to i wouldn't i won't have to use any extra glue like i do on a lot of boards it's a it's a really well solid built amplifier except maybe this one particular issue here that you're probably going to find on other amplifiers at some point uh, this is probably the same failure so uh yeah parts amp <laughs> yeah it's looking like it's gonna be a parts amp if i can't repair this transformer i mean i'm pretty good with small work so i may or may not be able to get this back together i mean i could probably open it up undo all the windings get the wind ratios but i mean i'm not that's too much work not worth it it's just this one side that's got the two leads that are, sh well, they're gone. They're melted off. So, so yeah. Well, I do thank you guys. I am going to leave this as it is here now, and I'm going to contact the owner, let him know what I have found on this board. And, uh... That Crescendo 17K, the output section, I'm going to slide that back together, fire up the power supply, and uh, see if it goes in the protect or not. And hopefully it doesn't blow up in my face. It shouldn't. Um, otherwise, that's going to, I think, do it for my live stream for today. So where are we at? We're at, oh man, two hours and 20 minutes. Way too long. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, hopefully you guys learned something. Uh, if you had any questions, you know, hopefully I got those answered for you. So... Uh, I do thank you guys for watching and uh, stay safe. Again, please, if you charge up your 
amplifiers, make sure that you discharge those rails if there's no discharge resistors on the board. Hint, hint, some of those type fours. Hey, base head, thanks for coming in. Uh, yeah, especially on those type fours, watch out because sometimes they do not have discharge resistors. Uh, so that's it for this, guys. I do thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments down below. I will get to you as soon as I can, and we will uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.